Hey everybody, so welcome to another edition of Reading Fun in the Sun. And today we are at the beautiful Crane Estate. And the book that we're going to be reading and reviewing in this video is really the story of how the very first Oxford Dictionary came to be, how the words were selected, and more importantly, who was selecting them. As you know, I am very passionate about equitable search, so this one really hit home. So if that sounds interesting to you, let's keep on watching. As part of this video, I am giving both of these books away for free. So if you want to be entered into that giveaway for both books, make sure you like, subscribe, and leave a comment below if you are interested. The original OED, Oxford English Dictionary, took over 50 years to complete. Over the course of that time, it was published in shorter books that contained the work that had been previously completed so that more people could access the information and also generate revenue to continue the project. Now, this was not the first ever dictionary project. There were actually quite a few, and I would encourage you to read The Professor and the Madman to really understand the full complexity of other dictionaries that were created because it is quite fascinating. But the thing that these older dictionaries were focused on were the unique and specialness of language, not necessarily the utility of language. Those older dictionaries really only focused on the uh, art of linguistics and not the full capacity of language for English. And the reason that the OED was originally conducted was to set or to settle, normalize the English language. Why did this need to happen? Well, before there was no accurate record of all the words in English. Other nations, like the Italians and the French, had whole committees dedicated to defining the language so that the people that spoke that language had a canonicalization or a normalization of their language. Up to this point, there wasn't something that extensive with English. And even to this day, English is not completely a canonicalization. However, because of the work at the OED and other dictionaries that came after, like the Encyclopedia Britannica and other things that fleshed the language out a little bit more, we do have a settling or normalized English language that we can draw upon. This is a major foundation of NLP. We have standardized language. We have taxonomies. We have linguistic principles that we can follow to actually mine from some of these terms and contexts. The OED had two distinct differences than previous dictionaries. The first is it was trying to have a complete list of all words that were even possible in the English language, from the most simplistic to the most complicated. The second thing it was focused on was more of a historical, morphological understanding of the language. English is a borrowing language. We borrow a lot of words from other languages and cultures. So how do we define these words in English? And when were they introduced to the English language? These are the things that really set the OED apart. Something that we, even in computer science, still use today is the OED looked for examples of context in literature to define what each word meant. And each word could have multiple contexts. And this is something that we still use today. When you are defining what the context of a word is, you know a word by the company it keeps. That is the main tenant expressed in The Professor and the Madman. The number one rule that the OED used was you can define a word as long as you can find it within the text to understand that context. The same can be said for NLP and search. If you are creating a taxonomy, and you need to understand if something is going to be effective for search, if you can find it in the text, it means it will have a stronger recall, a stronger precision than a term that is more categorical in nature. 
An example of this would be using internet protocol as a category of things versus HTTPS, which is a specific type of internet protocol. That is going to give you a stronger connection to content if that is what is actually in the content. So let's set the stage. Why even talk about how English was normalized and what we can learn from that exercise? This normalization of language, understand the context of language and who is defining those dictionaries and who is defining which text is being used for the context of words, that is all incredibly important to us in computer science and NLP. If you are only dealing with a corpus of information derived from a certain class, a certain language, a certain different characteristic of the authors, or if you're dealing with social media, a specific characteristic of those peoples, your machine learning is only going to be defined by those voices. And that is something that the original Oxford English Dictionary struggled with. The original OED was focused on deriving words from literature. Literature at this time was primarily published by men and men of prominence. So right there, the original dictionary was being defined from a male perspective, from a place of prominence. Not everyone associated with the OED came from prominence originally. James Moray, who was actually the main editor of the OED, had a very humble background, but eventually he did become a man of prominence. So that's one thing that both of these books really highlight is the voice that was missing. The fictional book is really focused on the voice of women and the terminology that women used was very much lacking as well as the language of the common people at the time, things that were deemed uncouth, those were not defined. Kind of think about the urban dictionary of today. You don't usually find those words in our common dictionaries. The other things that were not included were from the people that were deemed others. So this would be anybody that did not fit the norm of Victorian England. Now, let's look at how we can learn from this component of the original OED. When we are doing NLP, we have to always be thinking about our end user or the people that will eventually be using whatever is derived from our extractions and the insights that we are creating with our NLP projects. So if we are ignoring certain people in the population, that does mean that we are introducing bias and we are also introducing errors in our model because it's not actually creating information based on a full population. It's really just focusing on maybe the most prominent of, of, of people and voices. This could really impact your NLP project because if you do have someone that is using different language than that in the canonicalization of language, they might not find what they're looking for. Let's take your search engine analytics, for instance. If you look at the words that people are using when they are doing their search, and you include that in your models, you will have a much stronger model. Same goes with any literature. If you are mining things from literature and you're ignoring things that don't fit the uh, controlled terminology that you are using, all you're doing is overfitting your model to those controlled terms. You're not thinking about the alternative forms that those words can take. So if you take a lesson learned here, you can actually improve the way your search is done if you make sure the population is stronger than just the majority. Now, the OED had reviewers, lexicographers that were a core team. Those are the folks that were selecting what would be included and making sure that grammar was followed. These were the editors and editors-in-chief. However, there was a large population of volunteers 
And this is where we get into another lesson that we can learn from this. A lot of those volunteers that were sending in suggestions and sentences that they were deriving from literature were from all different populations. There were a lot of women, actually. The historical book here is talking a lot about how there were very prominent women that were educators, that were professors, that were interested in the OED and contributing to it. In that same vein, The Professor and the Madman is a historical account of a really interesting story. In fact, I felt that... uh, Life was more interesting than fiction in, in, in the comparison of between these two books because the story, and I will let you read uh, the conclusion of the story in The Professor and the Madman, but one of the top contributors of the OED was somebody that was a murderer living in an insane asylum. But he was very, very educated, very uh, knowledgeable And so in the time that he had, he actually suggested over 10,000 entries into the dictionary that you and I use every single day. And here is one of the last lessons learned, and that is we cannot expect the people and the data sets that we are looking at to express and have the same belief systems as, as we do. So make sure that one, you don't push your own belief systems out onto the data set and you don't judge those that are in the data set. We are scientists. We are here to determine the facts, not to judge. And we can exclude things if they are unethical or if they will harm someone, but these are real people. The data you are dealing with is from real people and oftentimes you will not know those details. Just stay objective as much as possible. All right, so overall, both of these books were really good reads. I would suggest The Professor and the Madman over the fictional book, mostly because the uh, it was very well done. There was a lot of good detail, a lot of really cool um, lexicography history there. Um, Unfortunately, there's not a lot of citation, and I think the author was actually given access to primary documents to write most of this book, but I do kind of wish I could look at the evidence to back up some of the claims and and quotations that he was using. As far as the historical book, uh, the historical fiction book, I did enjoy it, but I would say that... uh, it got slow towards the middle and there was also um, an event that happened in the book that made me very uncomfortable, that made me almost not read the rest of the book. Um, I did persevere, but just a heads up, there there is some things in there that might be um, kind of triggering to some people. I do think that the characters in that book were very well done, um, except for the main protagonist, who seems to more of a plot advancement technique rather than a a true character so both good reads but i would suggest one over the other all right so i hope this has been very helpful to you i had a blast reading both of these books i hope that you enjoy them too if you have read either of these please leave in the comments below what you thought of them all right so with that i want to thank you very much and i'll catch you next time